What do you do when the hackers come for you? Web criminals who take over your Twitter, your Facebook, even your email, and then pose as you to scam your family and your friends. If you think it can't happen to you, well, it happened to me just today. And tonight, I am going to show you how to fight back. Also tonight, are you sure you are who you think you are? My parents got us Ancestry DNA kits as Christmas gifts. And since then, our lives have never been the same and never will be. I know I'm here today. This woman now feels betrayed by her very genes and she wants a doctor to pay. And then, when the secrets are submerged, a group of YouTubers with very special skill set and a very large audience just did something law enforcement couldn't. See the mystery they solved from beneath the deep. It is all tonight on Banfield. Welcome to Banfield. I am Ashley Banfield, really, honest to God. And I say it like that because today there was kind of a question for a minute there about my true identity online anyway, after my Twitter was taken over by a hacker. Thank you very much. Uh, whoever it was decided to change my profile photo, that's not me, uh, erased my entire bio, and then for good measure went and deleted all of my tweets going back to 2015. That's a few. Uh, then they started posting things like offering scam giveaways to my 100,000 followers, all the while pretending to be me. But I busted them. And I did it using my other Twitter account so that I could let everybody know this garbage was a scam. Don't fall for it. There's no giveaway in 30 minutes. But that wasn't the end of it. That's when this, I don't know, headphone wearing thing uh, decided to switch gears, pretending that they were genuinely now trying to reach out to me to give me my account back. Oh, that's nice. It's also not true. At this point, this is really where it's likely they were trying to reach me to extort me, to sell me back my account. They even reached out to my friends, like News Nation's Brian Enton. Uh, they asked Brian how they could get in touch with me personally. It sounded so nice. And then they went ahead and just posted it. The message said, please tell Ashley on TV to contact me. I don't want this account. If it's hers, I'll send it back. Oh, it's so nice. Liars, 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 liars. That message was a sham too. And I know that because I'm me. My account was hacked early this morning. The message you're seeing was posted at noon, but I did not get control of my account back till four. So that bar is malarkey. It's annoying, yes. Yes, it's annoying. But it's also frightening because of how little I know about that guy, that girl, whoever it was, how little we know. Is this person working alone? Are they part of a criminal group? What have they been saying to my friends, to my followers? What have they been selling to all the people on my list? Have they used my account to hack other people? And what else have they been able to access? They got into my Twitter. Could they also get into my email? Oh my God, what about my bank accounts? You know, our news team was discussing it all this morning because, you know, I woke up kind of angry. Um, and that is when my senior story editor named Paula Freilich, and there she is, just happened to mention that she'd also been the victim of a hack a few years ago, uh, turned her life completely upside down, and digging out of the hole cost her thousands of dollars. So I wanted Paula to come on right away to talk to you all, let you know what she went through, what to look out for, and, and how to fix it if it happens to you. Okay, Paula, you blew me away this morning, so go ahead and blow away our viewers. Tell us uh, all what happened. Honestly, it changed my life forever. I remember it like it was yesterday. I was at home, I was working from home, and the next thing I know, boom, my phone stops responding to me. So I go on my computer and I try to get into my Gmail. I'm locked out of my Gmail. Then I try to get on Twitter. I'm locked out of my Twitter. And five seconds later, my internet goes down. So I'm really freaking out. I go to a cafe with internet, open up my computer, and that's when it starts to hit me. Oh my gosh, my life has been hacked. 
you know, I don't have a home phone. So there was no way to get a hold of anybody. And also, I'm a journalist. I travel to places like Afghanistan and Iraq. I've written stories about Russia. These people had all my photos, all my sources, all my emails, and I didn't know what to do, Ash. Yeah, if you're like me, I don't even know my kid's phone number. It's in my phone. It just hit auto dial with with everything. So yeah, it's uh, it's a little disconcerting all of a sudden. You know, when you're out well, of digital control. Okay, so w you want to repair this. I don't even know where you would start. Like, it started with Twitter, and then it spread to everything else. So what was your path? What would you do? Well, thankfully, I realized that I could still get onto my Facebook because I had registered it with a different account than Gmail. And I also had not linked my phone number. So I went onto Facebook, put out a massive SOS, said, you guys, my life has been hacked. This is urgent. People's lives could be in danger. Help me, help me. And I had one friend send me a security, internet security analyst who thankfully worked for me for a discount. It was still expensive. And I had another person say, you know what? I know someone at Google. And this is important because if you get locked out of Google or Twitter, there's no human that can help you. All they do is send you to something where you have to put in your personal information and then they'll determine if it's you. A machine will determine. And the problem was, these people had changed all my information. So the machine kept saying, this is not you, out. And I yeah. called the security guy and he said, go get a new SIM card right now. I put it into my phone. So it started working under a different number. And it turned out my phone had been hacked. My SIM had been hacked. And through that, all of my accounts linked to that phone had been hacked because they used the two-factor two identification problem. Well, there just in the lies the problem. Numbers. Yeah, because Absolutely. I was two-factor authenticated, and this still happened uh, to me. So, okay, uh, when we were talking this morning, you I hope you don't mind me throwing out this number there, but it was somewhere around $5,000, right, to, to get this all professionally fixed, because we're just, you know, we're just good old digital kids here working on our own, right, trying to, you know, figure it all out. And thank God I had News Nation, right? They got a whole digital department, and they went to bat for me. But all our viewers watching right now, Paula, they don't necessarily have a team of 50 50, you know that no people at Twitter, etc. Like, what did what did what what did you spend money to to get done? Well, also let's just point out, I didn't have five thousand dollars to spend. I had to get onto it. The issue was I had to pay the security consultant who tracked it back to the breach at my cell phone company. Then I had to get a whole new phone because with the new phone I had to download a lot of another apps for security. And then they were worried about my computer, that it had also been compromised, so I had to get a new computer. It was terrifying. And let me tell you what, when this happens, you feel like you're being attacked, but there's no one in the home. It is the most strangest feeling. Yeah, I can imagine. So how close did they get to your money? Because I think a lot of people watching might think, okay, so I don't care. It's not going to kill me if they get my Facebook. But it, it's such it's so pervasive, and the tentacles can just start in one spot and end everywhere else. How close did they get to your cash? They got very close to my cash. And had I not switched out my SIM card and started calling my banks, that would have been gone. And it sounds horrible, but here's the deal. I knew that I had FDIC insurance. I knew that that would come back. What I didn't know would come back is my information, my photos, and what if they went through my sourcing list and these people's lives were endangered? Yeah, well, that, and that's a really good point as well. I'm glad that you got out of that digital hole. I'm glad you're working with us, but I'm actually going to ask you if you could go back to work on the rundown because the show still has 40 oh, minutes no. left. <laughs> 50, actually. <laughs> Thank you, Paula Freilich. Appreciate it. It's Thank nice you. to have you on staff, too. Okay, I want to bring in Alex Hammerstone. Uh, he is the Advisory Solutions Director at the security consulting organization called Trusted Sec. And Katie Nichols is the Director of Intelligence for the cybersecurity company Red Canary. Okay, you two. You just probably heard the conversation that Paula and I had, and I'm assuming you heard the setup where I was all snarky and mad. I've had a lousy day. Can I just tell you, I had to take two leaves just to get through this day. So, Katie, I'm going to start with you. 
Do you think that I was targeted because I'm on TV or because I have a, a blue check mark next to my verified name? Or do you think it's because I have 100,000 followers or none of the above? Anybody watching is fair game. I'm going to say probably all of the above, but most likely you were targeted because of your followers. 100,000 is a pretty tempting number for adversaries, right? And you showed those tweets, the adversaries were trying to promote their scams, send us money. And so with that kind of financial motivation, right, it's really tempting for adversaries to go after targets like you who have a lot of followers who might fall for that scam and send them money. Yeah, and I'll tell you what, I wasn't worried that people out there were going to think I was that creepy dude that had a hoodie and a cigarette. That was what they were using to like, come on, that's so not me. And people who know me would know that's not me. What I was worried about was that they were somehow going to be able to get money out of people I don't know um, by posing as me and that people would have fall, you know, fallen for this uh, just bizarre Azuki giveaway. Um, so that's what I was really worried about, was that in the guise of being me, a lot of people would have lost their, their shirts for this silly contest. So Alex, I reached out to Twitter, um, wanted to ask them to, to help me sort of, you know, get some tips for the viewers watching right now. Because like I said, I have the Big News Nation team, Chris Sieper, I love you so much. Oh my gosh, thank you. Um, uh, but a lot of people don't. And this is all they could tell me, which was frustrating. Get two-factor authentication. Okay, check. I had that. And then refer to the help security and safety security pages. But but like Paula said, nobody to call, nobody to get some acute change before people's lives were, could be financially ruined by falling for the, the scam. That seems like a bit of a lapse. Absolutely, but really it's just the way it is, unfortunately. And these companies aren't necessarily in the business of giving the best customer service. And being able to keep you happy is not always their goal. And it costs them a lot of money to have customer service. So a lot of it's been offloaded to, uh, you know, algorithms and websites and everything else. You know, just like at the grocery store, it can be tough to find somebody to help you. It's very true on these social media sites as well. So the banner on the bottom of the screen says, who stole Ashley's identity? And I see the back of the head with a dramatic image that we're showing. But the truth of the matter is it's been beguiling all day. And Katie, I really want to figure out, like, who was it? The 2.30 in the morning messages that came in from Twitter saying somebody in Auckland, New Zealand is trying to, and then somebody from, I don't know, Federage or some a place I'd never heard of before. Um, but all I keep thinking about is I'm sure that they were using some kind of a fake location as well. What's the truth behind this or do we even know? Were they after it for fun? Were they after it for money for the scam? Or were they after it to get further in and get to all of my stuff like they got to Paula's and then eventually get to the banking? It's tough to say, but we can use clues they left behind, right? That tweet about NFTs, the scam component, the fact that they eventually did kind of get out of the account, however that happened. So it's really tough to know who is behind this. And you're savvier than many who realize just because an adversary was connecting from an IP in a certain country doesn't mean that's where they were. So I understand you want to get after this adversary, get back at them, but the tough reality is you're probably not going to be able to figure out who was behind that keyboard, who did that. I know it's frustrating. Can I just tell you, the vengeance in my heart is frightening. <laughs> <laughs> it scared me today I'm what scared. I wanted to do to that little bugger. Okay, uh, so here's what really happened. Uh, because I had all these great you know, corporate connections, Twitter really did jump on it and they locked it up real fast. And through um, emailing with me through my corporate account, they uh, were able to lock the account out. So the dude got or the dudette got locked out and couldn't do much anymore. But before, I think they smelled a rat. Um, I had actually gone in there and, you know, posed as um, me on my other Twitter. And I was commenting saying, it's a scam, it's a scam, it's a scam. So they knew right away I'd already gotten out there and was able to, to tell anybody that it was a lie. Then they switched gears. And that's what was so frustrating here is that they switched the gears and started to say, I want to give Ashley her account back. I'm, I'm really a good guy. I bought this account. Please tell Ashley to contact me. I don't want this account if it's hers. Oh, come on. Honestly, Alex, is, that, is there any possibility there's truth to that, that this is some, you know, magnanimous gesture from someone who bought the account, you know, 20 minutes earlier and, and then realized they bought a, a, a hacked account? 
So you never want to say never. And, and certainly there are hacked accounts that are sold and people hack these accounts with large follower accounts and then sell them to other people who will use them to try to monetize them. But really, you know, in my life, when people are caught doing something, they oftentimes have the most ridiculous excuses. They may sound believable to them and be theoretically possible, but are usually unlikely. But yes, I mean, it's, it's possible that they purchased an account they knew was um, you know, not quite right to use to monetize it, but that's, that's probably less likely. Well, I'm just, you know, not willing to give the benefit of the doubt on that one. <laughs> I for sure thought when they were trying to get Brian Enton to give them my number so they could call me and, you know, talk to me about getting my account back, I, I started to worry about them getting my family members too, you know, that kind of thing. So, Katie, um, one thing I couldn't understand, and I don't know if this will be helpful for people watching, but they changed my um, cover photo. Um, and they made it a drawing. They wiped out my bio and they deleted all my tweets back, going back to 2015. And I thought, well, if they're trying to look like me, why would they have done that? Can you solve that? I don't have an easy answer, but again, it suggests that their intention maybe wasn't to look like you. It was just to get their message out to get money because if they were trying to look like you, right, they could have just left your picture. They could have tweeted in a tone that sounds a lot more like you. You're, you're not one who I think tweets a lot about NFTs, right? And so that's yeah, just that right. probably scam mm -hmm. related, right? Probably financially motivated, but it's so tough to tell. As Alex said, why do humans do what they do? It's a tough right. thing to know. Well, Dan Abrams, like he, Dan Abrams calls me or texted me at 9 a.m. And, and, and said, oh, come on, this can't be you. I mean, it was so obvious right away with the imagery that they used and this, you know, this kind of language that I, I'm, you know, in my 50s. <laughs> this is so not me. <laughs> Maybe I'll catch on soon. But OK, the, the big thing I, I need to know, Alex, is what can we do? Um, I had the two factor authentication and this still happened. What can we do if you're watching right now and you think, yeah, I don't need this to happen because I don't have, you know, News Nation uh, digital team to, to fix it for me. What's the best thing to do? To protect. So keep in mind, one of the best things is to keep them from even getting to that two-factor screen. So one of the most common ways that scammers and hackers get into these accounts is by people who reuse passwords. They use the same password on multiple sites. And so that way, if one of those is compromised, uh, they can use that password on a different site. But also two-factor authentication, it's not perfect. Uh, you know, a seatbelt's not perfect either, right? It won't protect you in every crash, but you certainly wouldn't want to drive without it. Um, so, uh, you know, there are ways around two-factor, but that's really, you know, one of the best things you can do. Um, if you're concerned about some of the, the phone and SMS issues that are out there, you can use an authenticator app, um, which you can, you know, get on your phone and, and things like that. But really, you know, nothing's perfect. I mean, people, you know, they make a living and, and live their life by clicking on things and interacting with websites. And um, so you certainly don't want to uh, close to yourself and, you know, never, never turn on another computer. But there certainly are ways to use these things more safely and lower your risk. So just just button that that up again and, and let me know, like, Alex, how many, how, what are the odds this is going to happen to the people watching right now? I thought this would never happen to me. So what are the odds that you're going to get hit with something scummy? It depends on a lot of factors, you know, first, first of all, you know, um, if somebody, if you're somebody that they're going to target, but also just like a lot of other activities, it depends what you're doing, right? And it really is a lot like driving, you know, driving is certainly very dangerous for a lot of people, but uh, hundreds of millions of people do it every day with no problems. So really, you know, the more things that you're doing to protect yourself, the less likely you are to fall victim. But when you are a victim, remember that you are a victim. You know, one of the things I hate is victim blaming. You know, just because this happened to you, it, it doesn't, you know, mean that, you know, you're not as astute or anything like that. And that's one of the things I hate the most is when I see people blame victims of scams and crimes. So. That would be crappy. I have a platform on TV and I will do something nasty if anyone tries to pull that on me. One last question, and, and this, this speaks to the vengeance thing that I had Katie going on all day. Is what they did criminal? Is it prosecutable? If you could ever even find where they are, um, is this wrong, what they did? Definitely wrong and definitely illegal. Though the laws that might be used to prosecute it, they vary from state to state, right? At the federal level, often CFAA, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, is how a lot of these things are prosecuted, but it really depends. And what I would say, if you're looking for vengeance, one of the best things you can do, report this, right? If you haven't already reported to the FBI's Internet Crime Center, right? IC3, IC3.gov, let them know because 
if it's just happened once to you, maybe they're not gonna go after this adversary, but maybe they can put the pieces together. They can use that image or some of the tweet language. I'm literally writing it down together. as you're saying it, as you're Excellent. saying it. I see three, is it the number three or the word three? I see number three dot gov. Number three, Internet Crime Complaint oh, Center, ic3.gov. Tell them about it. Okay. Maybe the FBI can correlate it. It's unlikely. But that's the best chance I think you're going to get at any kind of vengeance, Ashley. Well, I also bought a voodoo doll, so there's that. Um, there you you guys, thank you so much, Alex Hammerstone and Katie Nichols. I have a feeling I'll be calling on you uh, a lot more in the future. Thanks for coming on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Stay safe. Thank you, you too. Okay, family albums, y'all, you know them, right? They're, uh, I love them. Uh, they are certainly one thing, but DNA tells the real story. And some stories come with shocking twists. Straight ahead, an Ohio woman whose entire life has been a lie. But how do you sue to get yourself back? One thing's for sure, she is hell bent on trying. Games start tomorrow and Morning in America's Nick Smith is going to uh, take to the ice to show Adrian uh, how he's going to learn the sport of curling. I wish he called me. Everybody in Canada does it for gym class, for heaven's sake. It's tomorrow, 7, 6 Central. Join Adrian and the team. Welcome back, everybody. Almost 80,000 babies are born in this country every year who would not have been conceived had their parents not had some clinical help. Assisted reproductive technology, as it's called, uh, accounts for roughly 2% of all the babies born in the United States annually. And according to the best available data, it almost always goes right. And when I say almost always, I mean 99 plus percent of the time. So what's the problem? Well, there's two problems, actually. Uh, the best available data is not the same as the best data. We don't have the best data because this whole category of medicine, in vitro fertilization, artificial insemination, techniques that make life itself, it is hardly regulated at all. Hmm. My guest, whom you're going to meet in a moment, says that your neighborhood nail salon is under more federal, state, and local oversight than a fertility clinic at a major university. Now, the second problem I mentioned is 99 plus percent is not 100 percent, which means mistakes do get made. Specimens do get mixed up. Sometimes they're tampered with on purpose. And then come the lawsuits from families who learn sometimes decades later that a daughter or a son is not the blood relative that everybody thought they were. Families like the Harveys of Ohio who don't exactly relish sharing their most intimate details with the world. It's not something anyone even knew about, uh, frankly, back when we had this procedure done. Um, so we're hoping that this news, we're putting our lives, our souls, if you will, out there. We believe that the policies need to change. We, we believe that things need to change in this industry. And if we don't speak out, who's going to speak out? Who? My next guest. That's who. She represents their daughter, Jessica Harvey. Jessica set out to find long lost relatives in Italy before her vacation. And it turns out she discovered she didn't have a relative in her own family. How did that happen? And who, maybe more importantly, is going to pay after the break? If you're going to make dreams come true for would-be parents who are almost out of hope, you'd better get it right. When you don't, that's where my next guest comes in. Uh, Ashley K. Sletvold represents families victimized by mix-ups and other problems at fertility clinics. Families like the Harveys, who found out 30 years after becoming parents that their daughter's biological dad is somebody else completely 
Uh, welcome, Ashley. Great name, by the way. Uh, nice to have you with me tonight. This is just such a distressing story because your client, Jessica, just wanted to go on vacation to Italy and maybe meet up with some of the old family relatives. And instead, she discovered the relative that you think is in your own family isn't. Your dad is actually a stranger. I mean, that's very, very depressing. So other than that fact pattern, um, what happened next? Like, what, what was the next step for the Har Harveys? Well, when Jessica's uh, original Ancestry.com results came back, there was just this sense of disbelief and um, obviously a desire to ask more questions. And so they started digging. They took another test with a different company, thinking perhaps maybe hoping there'd been an error of some kind. Uh, and then they went and took a, a paternity test with an independent lab and, and confirmed um, that Jessica does not have any biological relation to the man who raised her. Um, at that point, um, the digging sort of begins in terms of looking through the, the results from these tests uh, for distant relatives, for your closest, you know, second cousins, third cousins, to try to narrow down who might be the candidates for um, finding out who her biological father was. And we so went strange, I'm looking at the pictures. Actually, I honestly look at the pictures and she looks like her... Um... She looks like the dad who raised her. It's just, it's always odd when I see that, um, knowing now that he's not her biological father and nobody knew, you know, the, the, you know, the, the better of it. I want to play something about, um, from John Harvey, the, the dad who raised her, because a lot of this is, you know, emotional, obviously. That's got to be just bizarre to go through this experience and brutal. But then there's also uh, another part of this I didn't really think about. And it's all about what you've actually passed down to your children thinking you have actually passed down something to your children. So let me let me let John Harvey explain it. I'll ask you on the other side. My mothers and sisters, uh, they were healthy, lived, lived to uh, 99, 97, 95 years of age. And we have no history of cancer, heart disease, diabetes, or anything else in our family genes. And we wanted to provide that for Jessica. I was glad to be able to share that with their daughter. But now all the things are different. I mean, I'd never really even consider just how intense that must be realizing. You saw Mrs. Harvey on the right wiping her eyes. Part of the suit that you've launched, Ashley, is battery, which I thought, oh, that's interesting. And as I read it, it makes perfect sense. It says Mrs. Harvey did not consent and would not have consented to defendants placing a stranger's genetic material in her body. So what do you think the odds are of prevailing in the suit? And what is it that Jessica and her parents want out of the suit? Well, lawsuits can never take us back to before the person was harmed. Um, there's, there's no way to do that. Uh, but lawsuits can bring accountability. They can shed a spotlight on systemic problems. And as I've seen time and again, they can help people to heal through the exercise of, of seeking some measure of justice. Um, it, it, it never ceases to amaze me the, the strength and resilience of, of people who've had a, the shock of their lifetimes and come out um, on the other side, you know, feeling like they've really done something to help others avoid the same pain that they've experienced. So on the other side of the coin, for, for some people who, you know, maybe don't go the legal route um, and they're, you know, broken over this, Jessica has a sort of a, a, an interesting shall I say, added benefit um, fr from what happened. I don't know if I can say it that way. Let me let her say it. This is how she refers to the first real connection that she ever made with this random man who ended up uh, being her father. Uh, have a look at this. Um, we began to text. And once I started getting into some long texts, he decided he to just call me. So he answered the phone and um, that's when he admitted to me that he was at this clinic at the same day as my parents. and. I blurted out on the phone and I said, I don't want to surprise you, but I think you might be my biological father. And his exact words were, I'm not scared. This is great news. I've gone my entire life thinking I have no children and this is great news. I have a daughter. He's been absolutely supportive. He's helped me with any questions I've had. He's already given me some of the medical history on his side of the family to make me feel more comfortable about my new sense of life. 
um, he's been more than helpful. Wow. Ashley, how is Jessica doing? I, I'm not sure how much time has lapsed since, you know, she recounted that to, to today. How, how is she doing forging this new relationship with real dad who's never had a, a child? And how rare is this sort of development? Well, it's this whole situation should be much more rare than it is. And, and I think um, her biological father's reaction to this call kind of underscores um, the pain that can come from errors in the fertility industry. I mean, when, when he and his wife went to that same clinic, they were trying to have their own biological child and things didn't go the way they expected either. Who knows what would have happened had, had the clinic used his sample as he had intended. Um, it, it really uh, highlights you know, how physicians hold people's lives and happiness in their hands. Um, and, and it's always good when, when folks can make the best of a bad situation, but that doesn't take the bad situation away. It's an incredible story. Ashley Svet, uh, K. Svetmold, thank you very much for, for being on and sharing this with us. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. She had been missing for almost a full year, vanished without a trace. But it turns out she was just 18 inches away meet the YouTuber whose ingenuity resurfaced a mystery. He's gonna join me next. It was a nagging mystery for almost a year. What happened after Jan Shoup got into a minor car accident in Lakeland, Florida, and then vanished into thin air? The sheriffs had checked her out and said she was fine. And really by all accounts, it was kind of a fender bender. But when they left Jan at the Hunter's Crossing, a housing development that was under construction, something happened that to this day remains a mystery. Jan disappeared and so did her vehicle, a 2012 green Kia Soul, just like this one, that belonged to her sister, actually. That sister and three other sisters became frantic when Jan went off the radar. The days became weeks, the weeks became months, until a group called Adventures with Purpose entered the picture. They are a sonar search and recovery team that travels the United States looking for missing cars and missing people, posting their work on a popular YouTube channel. They just happened to be on a winter swing through the South when they made a discovery that investigators had been unable to do since last April. They found the Kia. And in it, police found Jan, submerged in a retention pond, just 18 inches below the surface. Turns out Jan had not made it far from that accident site last year. News Nation correspondent Brian Enton is on the story. Brian, this is just such an incredible discovery, especially since Jan was not that far from where that original accident was. It, it almost felt to me like that should have been an easy find, but these guys did it and they're pretty remarkable. Yeah, they really are, Ashley. I mean, this woman was missing for 10 months. Police had searched the entire area uh, and come up with nothing. Uh, these YouTubers show up. They were there for just two days, Ashley, searching several different bodies of water, having no luck. Uh, the last body of water they searched, the pond in that development, uh, that is when they made the discovery, they have sonar they use, and they found the Kia and realized there was a body inside. So then they called the police, and there's the, the Kia. You can see the uh, effects of almost a year of being submerged. Uh, they called the police, and it's the police who actually went in and uh, discovered Jan, right? Yeah, exactly. And that's sort of the way this group works. Um, you know, if, if they make a discovery like this, they will then get law enforcement involved to come out. And they were actually working with law enforcement in this situation. Uh, the police in the area had given them some leads and bodies of water that they hadn't uh, had a chance to search yet. So, yeah, then the police came out uh, and, and took it from there. So they've got 15 million viewers every month um, and they've got some pretty remarkable tools and and skills, more so than it seems the police. It's pretty amazing. 
Yeah, they've got this very complex sonar that they use. And I mean, their success rate is amazing. They have solved 26 cold cases um, in just the last two years. And one of the things that's so neat is they really just specialize in finding missing people's cars because of the sonar and the dive team that they have. Uh, so, so that's what they're really, really good at. Um, and, and they were able to do it once again in this case. So one of the four sisters, one of the four shoot girls um, is, is Vera, Jan's sister. You had a chance to talk to her? Yeah, uh, so, so basically, such a sad, I mean, you imagine what these families go through. After 10 months, no sign of her sister, no sign of the car. Basically, they had just given up hope. Um, and they had heard of this YouTube group, and she said, you know, I heard about them, but I thought, why should they even come down? There's been no leads. I don't want to waste their time. Uh, and obviously, she was so re so relieved, sad, obviously, but, but also has some level of closure. Listen to what she said. We're just in shock that they found her. Like the adventure people, I was going to turn them down because Polk County had no leads, no videotape, only that she had the wreck at Markham and Circle Loop. And I didn't want to waste their time because they've been looking for her for 10 months. So, so you can just imagine, Ashley, how grateful this, this family is right now to, to at least have some answers. Brian, 10 months to the day, that's the weirder part. Like literally yesterday was 10 months to the day that she uh, disappeared. So yeah, bittersweet. They, they now have the mystery solved, but it's certainly not the way they wanted it to be solved. Uh, Brian Enton, thank you, appreciate it. And by the way, thank you for helping me out with that whole Twitter business earlier today. Really, really like to know that you have my back like that. <laughs> I knew it wasn't you. I, knew, I woke up, I looked at my phone, I'm like, oh, this, this is fishy. <laughs> yeah, last time I sold an NFT, right? All right, well, Brian Enton is yeah. uh, doing the job, uh, do double duty today, working the Twitter uh, story and also doing this for us. Thanks, Brian. Um, and now joining me is uh, Doug Bishop. He is the lead diver with Adventures with Purpose. They're out of Oregon. His team located Jan's car and did it using some old fashioned sleuthing and some new age technology. Welcome, Doug, it's nice to have you. Thank you for having me. So the old fashioned sleuthing was finding out from the police about that, you know, fender bendery thing that had happened near the housing development that was under construction, right? But it seems to me that that's something that the police really should have known and looked, you know, with it. How far exactly was the retention pond and, and Jan's car from the spot where she had the accident? It, in proximity from where the accident occurred it was actually less than a quarter mile however at the time that the that the accident took place and she was she disappeared uh, this road was a really dark dirt road that led into a community that was being built the retention pond was put in several weeks prior and you know less than a couple of weeks after her disappearance there were homes erected around uh, this pond so very quickly time went by and, you know, these ponds were swallowed up by, you know, 20 or 30 homes that were built. It's pretty unbelievable. Like the fact that it's Lakeland, Florida, like there's a reason it's called Lakeland, Florida, yes. as I looked yes. it up. Uh, we'll show you a map here. There's a, a 1,100 bodies of water in this area, 520 lakes, <laughs> makes sense. Um, did you know right away that the body of water you searched in was going to be the right one or what was it about that particular retention pond given the fact that it was about a quarter mile away from the accident site uh you, you know a absolutely not we knew uh like you mentioned the, the vast amount of bodies of water that are in the area we, we knew odds were against us but you know we, we were determined we had two days scheduled and we were going to search every single body of water that we possibly could have that made sense within our target areas so um this was one of our last locations we did look at past historic, uh, you know, satellite imaging, and we were able to determine that at the time of her disappearance in April, these homes weren't built. So it was a, you know, a dark road that led right into this pond, dead in it. There was, there was, you know, it really wasn't even a road. It was just, it was muddy. And there was no homes there, and it was just a complete drop off, about a quarter mile away, right into this, this retention pond. Mm, maybe just disoriented, uh, you know, after the accident. I'm so curious, though, Correct. what do you guys have that 
law enforcement doesn't have. Everyone talks about these resources and this technology that you've got. Mm -hmm. What is it? You know, we do use cutting edge sonar technology and, you know, it, it is not something that is rare. However, our ability to use it to manipulate to find vehicles underwater is rare. You know, we do this every day. Law enforcement does not. And also, you know, the, the term cold case is, you know, a lot of people misunderstand that, you know, uh, law enforcement agencies have to justify the use of resources. And when cases become cold, they cannot use resources and they have to manage those resources appropriately. You know, we don't have that red tape. We don't have to have justifications to do our searches. You know, we come in, we work with the facts that we are given. We work with the facts that and the clues that we are able to uncover. And, you know, we work closely with local law enforcement. We put that all together along with our search tactics and we're very successful. And well, hey, you uh, just in October found a, a woman uh, who'd been missing for 20, 23 years with her 22 month old baby daughter. That's just remarkable. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, and uh, a week before that, we ended up finding uh, Carrie Mae Parker in Lake Tawakini, Texas, who was missing for 30 years as well. Well, I like you a lot, Doug Bishop. Um, thank you, not only for being on the show, but just for doing this incredible work that, that you do and for helping out Jan and her family to get whatever closure they can find to and all the others as well. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank, thank you for having us and giving us the opportunity to spread awareness. It's the community that allows us to really do this. Their support, their donations, and, and the, the watching and subscribing is what allows us to do this. Okay, well, let's let them know that right now. It's on the shirt, Adventures with Purpose. Like and subscribe and go. Yes, All right, Doug, thank Please you. Do. Appreciate it. Thank you. Jan's story, you know, really got us thinking about all of the bodies that have been found but never claimed and never named. Just how many John Doe's and Jane Doe's are there currently across the country just waiting to be reunited with a family or just waiting to be reunited with an identity? The answer is actually pretty astounding. I'm gonna solve that mystery next. You know, it's hard enough to solve a crime when you know who the victim is, but what about when you don't? That may be the case for a number of John and Jane Doe's in this country, unidentified bodies. And if you think it's just a few hundred, think again. According to the organization NamUs, the National Missing and Unidentified Persons System, there are actually currently 1,300, sorry, 13,784 unidentified body cases that remain open in the United States, 13,784. All of those souls just waiting to be named. Very sad. Uh, that's it for us tonight. Thanks so much for being here. We'll be back tomorrow night. Meantime, check out Adrian tomorrow morning in America. Thank you for watching. Click the red subscribe button below so you can get more of News Nation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage.